Uh, my name is Pinion. Uh, I'm the chapter chair of Info Ethiopia. And yeah, I would like to say uh, thank you for every one of you who joined us tonight uh, on our first talk of series of um, learning from Ethiopia. Uh, with this series, we uh, intend to inspire and facilitate learning from one another about local uh, uh, methods of designing and building, uh, of course, for a better built future. And then the program is a five month, month online uh, discussion with uh, one talk a month. And we'll be uh, talking about sustainable local building cultures of Ethiopia. And then um, our first uh, speaker for tonight is Enrique. He's uh, an associate researcher from Crater. And he'll be talking on about local building cultures for sustainable uh, and resilient habitats with some examples uh, from Ethiopia, of course. Um, yeah, and as we intend for this to be a very uh, a learning session for one another, and if you have uh, any reflections and comments, uh, you can uh, type it in the chat while he is speaking. And it would also be very interesting if you could come in later and share uh, your experiences and what you know. Uh, I think NRK uh, would elaborate this uh, a bit further. And um, yeah, uh, on behalf of everybody here, I'd like to thank him for accepting our invitation uh, to speak. Uh, and over to you, NRK. Okay. Thank you very much, Viniam. Thank you, Inbao, Ethiopia, all the members of Inbao, uh, for inviting me today. Uh, well, as Viniam was saying, uh, before anything, I wanted to, to ask uh, something to, to all of you. Um, when we speak about uh, local building cultures, I will explain a better what, uh, what we mean by that. Uh, um, do you think that uh, in any community you have visited, any village, any place, any urban area, uh, can you think about uh, a good uh, practice by, by this community, by these people uh, regarding a technical aspect or a hazard resistant practice or uh, green design or a beauty or whatever that uh, you, you thought, oh, well, this is a very good thing that people do by themselves. Um, so if you, if you can think about that uh, while I'm talking, uh, then maybe for the discussion, we will be able to share about, uh, about your ideas also and the things you know, uh, so we can share our experiences. So if I'm an architect. Uh, I'm also stu uh, well, I'm studying anthropology because it's uh, very related to to the work I do in Crater. Um, first of all, also I want to say that uh, in in Crater, in the organizations that uh, that have uh, allowed the research that I am going to explain today, they're not particularly experts in uh, Ethiopian architecture, but we are specialized in trying to understand what people do in different places of the world and trying to, to build uh, project strategies uh, from the strengths of the people, uh, from, from the strengths of local practices, uh, of local ways of living. Um, and that's the point of the talk today. I'm, I'm going to try to, to uh, explain uh, our approach and how we see that uh, um, architecture and that uh, uh, our projects can promote sustainable and resilient uh, habitats from people's strengths. Um, and before I forget, I want to thank uh, Crater's team uh, because this presentation is not uh, my work, it's a collective work. Um, particularly Olivier Moll, Thierry Geoffroy, Eugénie Crete, Philippe Carnet, Florie Desjean, Annalisa Caimi. And also I wanted to thank uh, Victoria Murtak that uh, uh, whom may be with us uh, tonight. I don't know if uh, she, she got to, to join, but uh, she was also a, a key person for, for this uh, work. So thanks uh, to all of them. Um, I will start uh, the talk with a brief presentation about Crater. Uh, Crater is a, um, is a 
two institutions in one. Uh, for on the one hand, we are a nonprofit organization created in 1979 in Grenoble, uh, France, and uh, we are also a research laboratory at the Grenoble School of Architecture since some years uh, later, since 1986. Um, our objectives are to improve housing and living conditions, to enhance uh, cultural diversity, and to integrate local communities in projects and make a better use of local natural resources. We have uh, lots of activities, uh, more than 100 per year in around 40 countries per year. We are uh, a team uh, with uh, different profiles like architects, engineers, anthropologists, archaeologists, uh, from different countries of the world and we work in a big network uh, unesco chair of earth and architecture and and also many many organizations uh, and uh, and uh, persons that uh, have been in, involved in one time or another in, in crater's activities including uh, they have studied in crater because uh, we have a post uh, um, uh, well, we have a specialization in earthen architecture and local building cultures uh, since many years now. We have three axes of activity, uh, heritage, uh, materials, and habitat, uh, which are relied, and they, uh, they transcribe the life cycle of a building. And we do activities of research, application, training, and dissemination in the three axes. Uh, very simplified, to fit into the talk, our vision is that uh, there is a vicious circle of construction with industrial materials, uh, with accumulation of waste and overconsumption of energy in all the stages of construction, from extraction of materials to disposal or, or transformation of the of the buildings. And uh, there is a virtuous circle of construction with local materials, with uh, reduction of energy consumption, consumption and uh, and waste to the minimum. Again, from extraction to abandonment and recycling. Um, so, and not only about environmental issues, but also about cultural, social, and economic uh, aspects, uh, we believe that there is a, a need to create a virtuous uh, circle of construction regarding all these aspects of uh, sustainable development without forgetting uh, governance. And we try to implement uh, our projects following an iterative method uh, first of all, understanding the context with uh, preliminary studies. Secondly, planning uh, and designing. Uh, thirdly, implementing and, uh, and finally evaluating and over again uh, uh, to understanding the context. Uh, so this uh, this facilitates upscaling in a, a profitable manner. Uh, so errors, can, mistakes can be smaller as they are done in like pilot phase projects and so on, and then we try to, to upscale with a better basis. Okay, what are local building cultures? Um, local building cultures are very related to vernacular architecture, but not only, they are not only that. They are the dimensions of construction or settlements, uh, which are more intangible, which are more the practices, the, knowledge is the know-hows and so on um, building cultures are very related to the site because uh, most of the times they are the materials used uh, for uh, for their uh, implementation are local materials they are very related also to the social economic and cultural aspects of uh, of uh, a place and uh, they relate to all the the phase the stages of construction of a building but not only construction also the, the use, the maintenance, the replacement, uh, the adaptation to new needs of the families and so on. And there, uh, as I was saying, the, their genesis and evolution is very linked to, to, to the specific uh, place uh, where they are and to the history of that place. There are several building cultures that can coexist in the same place. And uh, we can find similar building cultures in different places of the world. Uh, because of uh, similar climate uh, aspects, similar cultures, or, or um, so on. So this is a very short uh, presentation about uh, the concept of local building cultures. When we look at local building cultures, we are not looking at houses, or not only looking at houses, are the built element, um, object, 
we are looking at behaviors, architecture, human and natural resources, risks and vulnerability, natural and built environment, and many other aspects. Um, and uh, we are not looking at the, the beauty of natural materials, neither we are promoting heritage conservation. These are not the points of the local building cultures uh, approach, uh, even if uh, they, they can be uh, good ones, but this is not our, our point. Um, local building cultures are continuously evolving. Uh, they are not fixed in a moment of the past. They are uh, living, they are uh, existing, and they, are, they evolve with people. Uh, so new materials are introduced, new know-how, and uh, and uh, but sometimes uh, what um, what stays uh, longer is uh, the models, uh, the the typologies of housing or the designs. Uh, even if materials change, uh, even if there are some improvements in in the construction techniques and so on, because uh, there is a climate, there is a, some uh, kind of. Uh, um, there is an environment, there is a context uh, which uh, uh, can is is uh, maintained for longer. Okay. And why do we think that local building cultures are valuable today? It's because um, on well, there are many other reasons, but uh, on the one hand, there are around ninety percent of the population in the world who live and work in in buildings uh, which have been built without an architect or engineer, so without us. And so how can we have an extended impact in, for example, in development projects? Um, and also, for example, after disasters, only about 20% of the population receive assistance to, re to rebuild. And I would say it's less in many, many cases. So how can we impact the 80% of the population who rebuild by themselves? These are questions that I think uh, uh, we need to think about um, when proposing projects uh, in, reconstruction uh, after disasters and so on, because uh, we may do very, very good projects for very, very little people and uh, no one else will benefit from them because they won't be able to replicate, to, to, yeah, to integrate what we have uh, done in their own building uh, practices. So just as uh, uh, some elements, um, why we need to identify the strengths uh, of uh, and weaknesses of local building cultures and to uh, try to apply them uh, when implementing a project. Uh, how can we learn from local building cultures? Uh, there are many, many, many ways, but I wanted just to, to present here very briefly uh, three tools that we have developed in Crater together with many partners um, to try to uh, learn in an organized manner there are uh, the shelter response profiles. I will talk a little bit more about this because I will talk about the Ethiopian one, um, uh, which are uh, documents uh, with an overview of uh, the construction and the local building cultures of a place, of a territory or country. Uh, but this is very general information. Uh, then we have uh, a methodology which is uh, continuously also being adapted to different contexts. Uh, to the for the identification of uh, and the analysis of uh, local building cultures in a, in a more precise territories like a, a group of villages or a, a, a natural area which has similar characteristics and and then when whenever we find good local practices or technical solutions we try to uh, we try to identify them, we try to uh, catalog them, to validate them scientifically, and to put them into um, some kind of catalogs of uh, local building cultures, uh, which are uh, uh, worth uh, valorizing. So these three uh, tools among many others, uh, but I, I wanted to, to focus on these three. And uh, as I'm going to focus on the shelter response profile of Ethiopia, uh, shelter response profiles are uh, documents that uh, we are, uh, the production of these documents, it's uh, Crater, who is leading since uh, some years now. Um, and they are uh, endorsed by the Global Shelter Cluster and uh, some uh, organizations like uh, IFRC, UNHCR, 
uh, CRS care and uh, also research uh, in academic institutions such as uh, Oxford Brookes University or uh, the University of, uh, of Grenoble in France. Um, their objective uh, is um, to facilitate the identification of the strengths and weaknesses of uh, LBCs and, uh, and how we can uh, use them uh, in an adapted version if necessary uh, in situations of post-disaster, but also in, in situation of, uh, of uh, normal times, uh, like in development projects and so on. And uh, to help actors in assessing local building cultures. This is just the first uh, overview of the situation. And what we say is uh, whenever you have a project to do, go to the field, try to learn from people and try to learn from the context. And then you propose something that will be much more meaningful and, and adapted. So this is just the first step. Shelter response profile are a, a first step for uh, with uh, a target audience, which is more in uh, decision makers, uh, local, national, international, uh, NGOs, uh, government, civil society, uh, all these stakeholders that are involved in, in reconstruction, in preparedness, in prevention, in all these uh, um, uh, activities and uh, also in, in construction in, in normal times. Uh, they are free of access. Uh, you can access to all the existing ones uh, following this link. And these uh, documents are try to be uh, to have a very uh, big amount of pictures and try to mm, transmit uh, messages uh, as uh, easily as possible. But I don't know if uh, uh, we get to do it all the time. So. Traveling now to Ethiopia, um, the shelter response profile of, of Ethiopia is a 60 pages document you can find here in this link. Um, it was produced in 2018 after a request from the shelter cluster in Ethiopia with the active participation of a focal person uh, in the national shelter cluster, uh, who was uh, Victoria Murtaga, as I said before, and uh, of some organizations in the field. Uh, who helped gathering some information, some pictures, and so on. And um, very importantly, uh, we reviewed about around 70 documents, scientific papers, uh, books, uh, official documents, regulations, uh, reports uh, that made possible the production of this uh, profile. Um, you see all the contributors and, and uh, authors uh, here in this slide. So, the country profile uh, is the, the second chapter of this. Uh, well, the first one is a general introduction. The second one is a country profile with uh, mm, a general description of the country, some important data, also information about uh, climate change impacts, about um, refugees, uh, IDPs, uh, and uh, returnees, uh, as uh, this uh, document uh, was produced in a context of uh, protracted uh, crisis in, in Ethiopia. Um, there is a chapter three, which is the analysis of housing with uh, information about uh, institutional framework, about uh, um, uh, legal framework, about uh, tenure security issues, also about the construction sector um, and so on. Then the two main chapters are four and five. Um, Chapter four is a general description of local habitat uh, in the first part of the chapter, starting uh, from vernacular housing uh, with the different uh, types of uh, structures that we find uh, throughout the country. Uh, and you see some pictures here and uh, starting with uh, timber structures uh, with earth and fibers filling, chica, load bearing stone masonry walls with earth and mortar, bamboo and thatch walls and uh, wooden mats huts, uh, used by the nomads. Then we also try to speak uh, briefly about precarious housing and about uh, globalized housing, uh, which are the three uh, divisions of habitat uh, of housing that we, we make. Uh, and, uh, but we don't focus on these uh, kinds of, uh, of habitat uh, of housing, okay? Then there are some data about uh, uh, 
the households and how they're organized and what is the organization of habitat, the conditions of use and access to water, sanitation, etc. Then there is a part of chapter four, which is uh, focused on, on each uh, federal state and uh, uh, with uh, one page or two pages uh, per, per, uh, per region. And, uh, and then we go to chapter five, where we try to condense uh, some of the learnings about uh, uh, local habitats. So for example, regarding hazard resistant practices, uh, green design, uh, comfort, uh, health issues uh, related also to uh, beauty, uh, um, also to the lifespan of buildings, the maintenance, uh, also to social cultural practices fostering resilience. And uh, we try to, to address all these topics and, and to put some of the uh, practic practices and that we have uh, identified. And we are sure that there are many, many, many others. Um, but this is the work of, uh, of each one of us when we go to the field and we, we have to do a project is to identify the particular uh, local practices existing in a territory, as I have uh, already said before. And then the final uh, chapter of the, of the document is uh, a presentation of some contemporary projects. Um, and chapter seven is about uh, some uh, useful resources and uh, the sources used, uh, used to produce the, um, the document. So now um, I'm gonna go through some of the local good practices that we have found uh, that exist in, in Ethiopia. And uh, uh, sometimes you may think they, they are simple, but this is not a, a bad thing. Uh, it's uh, about uh, um, the capacity or the ability of uh, people of mastering these practices uh, without uh, being in danger. Um, for example, regarding hazard resistant practices, uh, we've, we know, or you may know that uh, Ethiopia, uh, different zones of the country are prone to different uh, hazards. Uh, including drugs, uh, floods, earthquakes, volcanism, insects infestation, fire, cyclones, and uh, also black cotton soils, and which are not in the same level of uh, of hazard, but which exist and affect uh, population and the houses where they live. Um, so some of the practices that we have found in different areas of Ethiopia uh, are, for example, regarding hazards. In flood prone areas, uh, some communities build their houses uh, on earthen mounds. And they work as uh, sacrificial masses. And you need to, to maintain them and every now and then, particularly after the rainy season, but they work uh, really well to protect uh, the walls and, and the houses and to maintain them uh, in a good uh, mood. We found this is a similar strategy used, for example, by the Alaba house, uh, by the Alaba. In, in Alaba houses, we find an earthen plinth with a step shape forming a circular bench around the house. Uh, what serves to avoid damages from rains, but also from floods. We also find in some places that uh, the roof structure is uh, borne by an independent uh, structure, by an independent frame. What uh, in case of damage to the walls um, by an earthquake or by floods, uh, it makes possible for the roof to stand, and so it uh, it becomes uh, um, it becomes uh, less expensive to rebuild for families, and also less dangerous to to be killed or injured by by the the construction itself in case it uh, falls down. Um, we also find this practice uh, among some Nur and Anuak peoples in Ambela who, who have uh, two places of residence. Uh, they, they are in the lowlands uh, in, the grass, in the dry season, living in, mostly in grass houses, and they move to the, 
to the highlands uh, to chica houses during the rainy season so um, this is also as a resistant practice that we found um another practice is in the amara region uh, we found that uh, some houses built with uh, chica structures are uh, the, the the base of the house the ground floor is protected by a uh, stone masonry walls on the ground floor and this ensures the, the stability of the overall structure because the, it works like a uh, bracing and uh, also allows a better transfer of uh, of loads uh, to the to the build to the to the ground this strategy also works uh, for of using heavy materials in the ground floors and uh, light and flexible materials in the upper floors on the upper parts of the construction is also a good one for for earthquakes because uh, these uh, light and flexible materials uh, endure better the, the the movement produced by by shaking by the earthquakes so uh, it's uh, less easy that uh, they collapse uh, or they crack and in case they do they they can cause less injuries um than heavier materials of course we have some practices which are more uh, sophist sophisticated, uh, less used by people, but uh, which are also found in in, uh, in uh, vernacular architecture. Uh, here we have the monkey heads, uh, which is a technique which is uh, we, we have found uh, it exists in different uh, uh, with some variations in different places of the world, uh, and which is a very good one for for uh, resistance to earthquakes. Um, you see the drawing here, which explains a little bit uh, how it works. Uh, there is a, a long square timbers tying the entire building, uh, which are connected by these uh, monkey heads. And uh, this uh, works really well to, to keep the masonry uh, together and to avoid the uh, uh, out of plane uh, collapses. Um, then we have uh, we have also identified the practice in this church in which is found in in Bura in Amara region this church is uh, interesting because this this space which is uh, between the exterior and the the walls uh, of the church uh, this veranda um, is used apparently uh, for menstruating women uh, in other for them to be able to attend to the religious services with that, without entering the, the temple because they are not allowed. Um, but this also has a, uh, a good uh, um, impact in the stability of the walls um, because uh, this uh, territory has uh, black uh, cotton soils and uh, which are very expansive soils. And uh, so any uh, variation in the moisture content of the, of the soil uh, will make uh, walls crack. So the, the fact that, that the, the building is, first of all, the fact that the building is built on a mound that might be built with a less expansive soil. And the fact that the walls are protected by, by these uh, eucalyptus uh, fence uh, makes makes the walls uh, like uh, move less in case of uh, when, when there is uh, rains and uh, and the the soil starts uh, starts moving uh, because of these uh, uh, black cotton soils so we also have this practice that uh, you may know about uh, uh, dorsey people who build uh, houses which uh, they know at a moment or another, their their posts will, will be rotten. The the bamboo, uh, the basis of the bamboo posts. So, uh, from time to time, every approximately four years, they will just uh, cut this uh, structure, vertical structure, and they they will uh, together with uh, the neighbors and so on. They will just. Uh, um, Put the house again on the floor after cutting it, and uh, and it will last for more than 40, 40 years, um, just becoming a little bit shorter uh, uh, every four years. Uh, so 
as I was saying before, people also have these, uh, um, in many places, they decorate their houses. They try to make them beauty, like everyone. Uh, and uh, this is also an important feature to have into account. Uh, there are also features about uh, uh, green design, we could say. Like, for example, these uh, Alaba houses uh, where the top of the wall uh, under the roof is left uh, without plaster, what uh, allows for ventilation and uh, also it uh, makes, uh, it, it let the smoke uh, out um, of the house. We also find uh, some uh, places which are, which are not houses, but uh, they are very important for communities like these spaces of uh, conviviality where people share uh, in community uh, and where many many different uh, aspects of the social life uh, take place. For example, here in the Conso uh, villages, uh, we find the moras, uh, um, which are structures that they are very much used by this uh, by by the Conso. And uh, also regarding practices, uh, social cultural practices, we find that in in some places, uh, building a house is not a matter of uh, a family alone. It's a matter about of the, the, the neighbors. It's uh, something which is uh, shared through working parties. For example, in the Berta society, uh, where um, uh, someone who wants to build a house will provide uh, with food and, and beer, uh, and neighbors will come for help. And they will do the opposite when it comes uh, the time for building the house of a neighbor. So all these uh, aspects are very important uh, when we get uh, to a place and we try to, to, to do a project. It's important not to kill all these uh, practices which are very important for, uh, for the local people. So in conclusion, Local building cultures have uh, advantages. I haven't uh, spoken about uh, weaknesses, even though you will find some of them in the in the document, uh, in the shelter response profile. But I wanted to point out the strengths because uh, we are not uh, always used to look about uh, architecture without architects uh, with uh, positive eyes. So these uh, local building cultures have uh, advantages. Housing and habitat is adapted to people's needs, wills and habits. There is a rational and frugal use of locally available resources. And when there is not, uh, some solutions might be found in some time by the community because they will have to adapt to the new context. Uh, there is existing knowledge and know-how, which is locally mastered. And so we have less uh, opportunities to fail. And uh, we can use this uh, knowledge and know-how to improve living conditions of population because we invest locally. In uh, an event of an earthquake of a, a, or another disaster to quickly have shelter for more people because uh, the materials are there and very usually. And uh, as I said before, the, uh, the techniques are mastered by people. We can keep reasonable construction costs and promote the replication of construction, not promote, but uh, facilitate, because it's, uh, as I was saying before, the 80% of the population who are not assisted uh, directly by, uh, by uh, uh, recovery projects, uh, they will learn from the projects that we implement, and they will try to apply uh, in their own houses uh, sooner or later. And uh, if the projects that we propose are easily understandable, uh, easily uh, replicable. It will be a, uh, a very, very big uh, advantage uh, for uh, local communities. And also to promote bottom-up development, to ensure cultural adaptation and good functionality of spaces because people won't live in the same way in one place or another. There are different uh, ways of living that we have to understand and to respect and to uh, at least to, to try not to kill these ways of living because 
anyway, people, many, many, many times uh, it has happened that uh, shelters have been built and people haven't really used them because they weren't adapted to their way of living or they have completely um, uh, rebuilt them to make them suitable for, for their ways of lives. And also to reduce the vulnerability of inhabitants in the long term. Um, looking at uh, all these pillars of, uh, of sustainable development, um, which are the basis of, uh, of uh, vernacular architecture and of uh, local building cultures in many places of the world. Um, and uh, as I said in the beginning of the talk, local building cultures are continuously evolving. And these local dynamics, we have to take them into consideration. And we need to, to accompany people to allow to access to new knowledge also and to new materials and improve the existing when, when it's necessary, but uh, taking advantage of the existing. We, we cannot deny what exists uh, when we arrive to a place. We, we have to, to take profit of local building knowledge and practices of uh, local coping mechanisms of local dynamics and uh, so that we design contextual projects that are able to strengthen local capacities and resilience. So finally, I have a motto that I sometimes use uh, in presentations or, or lessons. If you ever have to implement a shelter or housing projects, particularly in the humanitarian or development sectors, before planning, designing, or doing anything, open your eyes and understand the context, the context. Open your ears and try to listen to people and to ask questions before giving answers. Open your mind, because you will find many answers in people's practices and in the intelligence of local solutions. And uh, that's all from my part. Thanks for your attention. And now it's time for discussion. I think I went. Uh, uh, a little bit uh, longer than expected, by, but uh, I'm sorry for that. Not at all. I think it was perfect. Uh, thank you again, Enrique, for this amazing presentation. We're very honored to have you here. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, you can raise your hand or send it in the chat, whichever is more comfortable to you. Uh, but Enrique, again, thank you very much. This was very eye-opening, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we do have a question from Juliet. You may take the stage. Hi, thanks, Nina. Um, thank you very much, Enrique. That was a fantastic, fantastic talk. I would like to know how we can change attitudes to construction outside Ethiopia, because it seems to me that there's a, there's a culture of maintenance and repair that is very important to, to sustain, but also to scale up more broadly at, at an international level and how you how you think perhaps we can change change the ways that we build well for for me when when people live in the houses that uh, they are used to live they know how to maintain them because they are used to do it the problem comes when we introduce new techniques or new materials and so on and and then there is a there is a need of uh, of uh, training uh, of uh, communicating and saying well this doesn't work uh, as uh, uh, the house you used to have or or but anyway there is a, an importance of uh, thinking about the means of people to maintain because sometimes uh, when we see people uh, maintaining um, a mud plastering. We know that they they can reach all the materials without uh, having to to spend money, or it's just a matter of uh, knowledge about what is the good earth uh, or the good the good materials to mix with that to make it more durable and so on. But if you put uh, if you change the materials and then you change to cement plaster, uh, then there is a need to 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 buy cement from time to time, and then maintenance it becomes. Uh, more difficult for families who don't have access to to lots of 
of uh, financial means. So this is also a matter about uh, what we propose or, or new techniques and, and how they enter the, the, the financial world. Thank you. No, that, that's a really, really good response. Um, I saw some people have hands, hands up, so more, more questions coming your way, but yeah, really great. Um, we can go with, I think, response. Alika has raised yes. her hands. So Alika, please proceed to ask your question. Okay, well, uh, until then, uh, Olivier ha has asked that maybe the planet will force us to change climate to change climate change. Limited non-renewable resources. One strategy to change is to teach all these useful alternatives at an academic level, which is, I think, is a good strategy to proceed in introducing these techniques to different people around the world. World. Um, next question. I we have Diana Yu. Uh, she says, Ethiopia is a fast-growing country in Africa. Is there any concern about the preservation of local building cultures, particularly when there is an exceptional collection of building cultures in Ethiopia? Enrique, if you can address that to Diana. So uh, I would say Ethiopia should answer this to this question. So if someone in the in the room wants to, to, to speak. No, I, I don't think there is anyone yet. I think it's best if you address it regarding it's close to the research, the intense research you've just done. I mean, there is a concern about the preservation of uh, local building cultures all, are, all around the world. Uh, but uh, also, as I was saying, Local building cultures are evolve are in continuous evolution. So we need um, to to make the difference between heritage and local building cultures, and as they are not fixed in the time, they 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 evolve with uh, people's uh, practices, with people's needs, with uh, people's wills, and uh, so on. But anyway, if uh, if anyone from Ethiopia wants to, to give an answer to this question. Yeah, um, uh, maybe I'd like to say uh, something brief. Yeah, as, as you've said, of course, it's a very uh, rapidly transforming country and then you can actually witness this in the cities uh, where the building culture is um, well, uh, somehow uh, neglecting this local traditions, let's, uh, let's say, uh, where using modern materials and uh, yeah, shifting to the industry is uh, considered uh, kind of um, keeping in with the time, let's say. And uh, uh, But th these practices are very much alive elsewhere. And uh, as Enrique was saying, uh, the, the issue here is not so much uh, as uh, preservation, but what can we learn from them and how can we uh, really uh, adopt or innovate upon this to uh, meet uh, current uh, or I mean, contemporary needs? To, and how can we rethink the future uh, thinking uh, all the global challenges that we're facing together? So um, that, that's also what uh, uh, Intvo, I think, uh, Intvo Ethiopia is uh, uh, trying to uh, put out there, like what can we learn from these practices and how can we innovate upon them to make them relevant in our uh, everyday life uh, in the here and now, and as well as in the future. Thank you. Another topic I personally wanted to ask is, earlier you said that there's a huge difference between vernacular architecture and local building cultures. And I think if you can elaborate more on that, as I think most people kind of use those terms interchangeably. So if you can give us a, a bit more detail. No, I just, that. I was, I was saying, uh, did I say it was uh, completely different uh, or? I, I meant have, to, there's different yeah I, I meant to say that uh, that the, it's not uh, the same thing 
because uh, maybe we understand by vernacular architecture more the uh, the built environment only the the architecture itself and local building cultures goes uh, go beyond that uh, to practices to beliefs to uh, the local environment to the risk and vulnerability in, in a particular area to uh, yes uh, so for me vernacular architecture is inside uh, local building cultures but uh, local building cultures is uh, is uh, broader Okay, definitely. Um, another question we have from Sam Rawit. Uh, how can this practice be adaptable into the modern architecture? Well, we see in we see in many places, for example, I will I will speak about what I better know. Um, in Crater, we we uh, work a lot with earth and architecture. And uh, since many, many years now, at the beginning we worked, uh, they worked because I was not there, uh, more uh, focused on, on earth and architecture. And uh, we have moved towards local building cultures because it's uh, broader. And in some places there is no earth, so we don't build with earth. But what I, what I was going to say is that uh, some uh, years ago, uh, there was uh, the first uh, Terra Award, which was the, the, the architectural prize for earth and architecture uh, all over the world. And many, many contemporary projects uh, came to this uh, award to try to be awarded with one of the prizes. And it was a huge success, I think, because uh, it was, uh, somehow it was to say that th these techniques uh, can be alive uh, in the present times and uh, we can do anything we want with them uh, from schools to uh, colleges to universities to hospitals to uh, no matter what uh, anyway you have to to think that it's uh, for me it's more a matter of uh, of uh, um, will uh, so Dissemination, uh, trying to uh, to valorize uh, these uh, local building cultures and these uh, local materials and so on, uh, is one of the for me it's, it's one of the first steps. And uh, uh, yes, uh, to adapt these cultures to to the modern architecture, yes, to the contemporary architecture. I hope that answers Samari. If not, let us know. Uh, another question from Volkmar. He's asking, are there any studies or examples on how to combine traditional uh, typologies and new materials or technologies for a modern 21st century society? So, are there any studies? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, well, I, I don't know about studies, uh, but examples, I, I think there are because, uh, um, yeah, sometimes you have the, the respect for traditional ways of living and uh, typologies and so on, and you just think about changing some materials now and then and, and, and changes the, you change the house. Uh, completely, but uh, you can do it, uh, and there are many examples of that, I think, uh, in many development projects and uh, all over the world. And we see the, the how we swift uh, materials from uh, mud brick uh, to bone brick or to uh, concrete blocks and, and so on, for example. But uh, one question would be also, what uh, is that a good evolution, or it depends on who will be living in that house? Are we are we creating more opportunities uh, for that family, or we are on the opposite? Uh, we are creating more problems to them if they won't be able to maintain the house, if they won't be able to comfortably live in the house without, uh, for example, fans or electricity. Uh, or you know climatization uh, because these are materials which uh, tend to be uh, 
less uh, adapted to local climates. For example, CGI roofs uh, have uh, some advantages, but uh, we need to see that they have also many disadvantages in terms of uh, maintenance, if the, in terms of uh, climatic uh, uh, comfort inside the houses without uh, ex uh, expensive in, in energy and so on. So it's always a matter of uh, balance. And I think uh, we can use uh, modern uh, materials and technologies in the places of the house way, where they are important. For example, we can use concrete blocks uh, for the foundations and uh, for the plants and then build a fresher house in the rest of the walls that will be easily maintained and so on. Uh, well, this is just uh, my point of view, but uh, I think that the balance is important between what we think is um, is modern and what uh, we think should be modernity and the future where we want to go. Yeah, I, I think that's a very fundamental uh, remark. Uh, what's modern and what's not? Uh, usually these are, uh, especially in the context like Ethiopia, it's uh, usually uh, it's borrowed ideals of uh, modernity uh, that we aspire to um, emulate to uh, the developed other, what um, there is this idea of uh, global uh, world class city making, uh, which we are really trying to uh, build a certain kind of image. Uh, but uh, if we deconstruct the, the, that idea of uh, as being modern, then uh, I, mean, I mean, our question would, would radically shift, uh, I think. Um, having said that, um, what I wanted to say, I think we only have a few minutes. Uh, when you started in any case, um, you mentioned that about 80% of these people are living in self-constructed houses uh, across the world. Uh, does, uh, and then uh, you were asking how can we impact or yeah, how can we uh, extend our reach? Um, but that, I mean, doesn't it beg the question um, or I mean, do we need to really uh, do do these people for need the expert architect? Well, I, in fact, when I was uh, when we when we do projects as architects, we create uh, examples, and uh, and people learn from examples also. So. If we give, uh, if, if we build good examples, then they will be fed by good examples. Uh, uh, for instance, there there is a there, there are some studies which uh, show that uh, uh, the construction of schools in some countries of Africa have a, um, has a, an impact in uh, domestic architecture uh, around the, the the schools. So. If we build schools which are adapted to the to the local environment, local climate, uh, local materials, and so on, it sure that we can introduce some improvements to the local technologies and local practices. But if we introduce some improvements that are easily applicable by people later in their houses, then this will be for me. This will be a step forward, and not a step back. Uh, so that's uh, for me. That's the uh, our duty should be to build projects who will help people have better houses and not worse houses, less uh, secure and uh, um, more more prone to 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 being affected by hazards and uh, uh, less easy to maintain and. Uh, hotter and less less practical for their day-to-day -day life so that's a little bit the idea that uh, when we have the opportunity to do a project try to do it the most adapted to the context uh, uh, that we can uh, thank you very much enrique unfortunately we are running out of time so uh, we can't get to a few more questions uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this meeting. We're very honored you can join us. Enrique, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. 
It was really interesting. We look forward to hearing more from you. Uh, Juliet, thank you for helping organizing this. We really appreciate it. And everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you have a good night and a good day. Have you Thank you very much. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, one, one thing uh, I, I, I would also, like to add. Yeah, um, yeah um, this is, uh, of course, as I mentioned in the very beginning, it's a five months uh, long talk series uh, where we have one talk uh, every month. Uh, and ne next month, uh, uh, we will have a different speaker, uh, Stefan. Uh, he's a professor at the Aga Khan uh, University, and he will be discussing um, about Islamic architecture, uh, focusing on uh, uh, Nora Mosque and then uh, other um, uh, architectural uh, elements around it. And uh, you can find the details uh, on our website. Uh, please, uh, yeah, try and do join us uh, for that talk as well. Uh, and if you want to join the Intel network, uh, you can uh, also um, find it uh, uh, on the link. I think we now will be sharing it. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you very much. Bye bye.